help. A single word which is simple to spell, easy to say, difficult to ask for, and impossible to accept when pride is at stake. We all need help when life gets tough, but the harder life becomes, the less we are willing to accept it for fear of admitting defeat. And yet without help, we cannot succeed. We're surrounded by people who can help, all of whom are ready and willing to sacrifice something to save us. But being victims of our own circumstance, help is often the first word we think of when things get bad, and the very last word we will ever utter. By the bleak winter of 1952, barely weeks after the cruel murder of Ethel Christie, and shortly before the senseless death of Kathleen Maloney, being ailing and ill, lonely and desperate, with his dark urges festering, and being too broke to secure the services of sex workers, Reg Christie stalked the cafes of West London, preying on vulnerable women in search of his next victim. Some of what follows is based on the killer's own memories and perspectives, so what part of this story is true is up to you. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, this is Murder Mile, and I present to you part 8 of the full, true and untold story of the other side of Ten Rillington Place. Today, I'm standing on the Seven Stars Roundabout on Goldhawk Road, W12, one and a half miles southwest of Rillington Place, three miles west of the Great Western Pub in Paddington, and several tube stops away from any location we visited before, but a place very familiar to Reg Christie. As a T-junction interconnecting Paddenwick Road and Goldhawk Road, the Seven Stars Roundabout is as dull as it sounds, with the only sound in this bland grey landscape being the steamy splattering of puke, piddle and dog plops, as every car, truck and bus whizzes around this inch-high tarmac traffic island, past a handful of pointless shops, most of which are shut, and several road signs, there to remind you that the only reason you've come here was to go somewhere else. In 1952, on the ground floor of 240 Goldhawk Road, sat Peter's Snack Bar, a classic British greasy spoon serving such delightful culinary delicacies as bacon butties, sausage sarnies, heart-hardening fry-ups, deep-fried diabetes, a stroke in a bun, or any form of foodstuff as long as it could be cooked in a single pan of hot salty fat, was made from pig's parts too shoddy for dog food, could be cunningly disguised by a kilo of ketchup, and mashed up so heavily you couldn't tell an eyeball from an asshole, And yet, it was here, whilst working just a few doors away, the Reg Christie would pop in for a quick cup of tea, a spot of lunch, and a chance to lure another vulnerable woman to her death. On the 6th of December 1949, at 2.10pm, Four days after the arrest of Timothy John Evans, Police Constable Mount of Harrow Road Police Station was assigned to a routine task at Ladbroke Grove. PC338, proceed to 133 St Mark's Road. Suspicious object found. Over. Roger that. Situated a few doors down from Rillington Place, 133 St Mark's Road was now a derelict shell, with its walls charred black, Windows smashed and doors stolen, having been bombed during the Blitz a decade earlier. Alerted by two children, between two floorboards, PC Mount unearthed what looked like a milky white ball. Only its shape was uneven and broken. Its sound was brittle and hollow. Its texture was smooth and hard. And its colour was like an old stick stripped of bark. Harrow Road, this is PC338. Object found at 133 St Mark's Road is an adult human skull. 
Jewel missing. No other body parts found. Over. Thank you, PC338. Over. And that was that. The police had discovered the decapitated skull of a female in her early 30s. And they did nothing. There was no press coverage, no autopsy, and no investigation. But then again, why would they? With thousands of people listed as missing after the Blitz, and millions of bones and body parts still littering the city, being just another skull, it was bagged up, catalogued, and stored in the Kensington mortuary. And although they didn't know it, this skull was special, as having been buried in a nearby garden seven years earlier, dug up by a mongrel dog, Disposed of by the flat's tenant, she believed I could cure her, who hid it from his wife. Tease up, Reg. And with the victim's family, believing she had died in a bombed-out air raid shelter in Putney, this long-forgotten skull would help put an end to the life of London's most infamous serial killer. But before that, three more women would die. Rita Elizabeth Nelson was born on the 16th of October 1927 in Belfast City Hospital and raised by Protestant parents, James, a labourer, and Lily, a housewife, whose life revolved around the teachings of the Presbyterian Church. As a middle child of three daughters, with May, the eldest, and Sadie, the youngest, Rita's life was led by the Bible in the hope of making a good woman out of an unruly girl. But burdened by a high sense of pride and a rebellious streak, Rita's stubbornness created a friction in the family who abhorred theft, alcohol and sex out of wedlock. Rita was an enigma, a deliberate mystery who hid her true self behind a facade. Why? We may never know. What we do know is that she was five foot five inches tall, of slim build, with a thick mop of wiry brown hair, like she'd been caught in a breeze. Small brown eyes, like little acorns lost in a blanket of fresh snow. An eternally furrowed brow, like life was digging a grave into her brain. And missing four teeth, a wide mouth, which grimaced, grinded and grinned, but rarely smiled. With her lips and nails slathered in a thick coat of fiery red, she resembled a ray of joy, but the colour only disguised her sadness. With a posh affectation, she sounded like a real lady from a well-to-do family, but her accent only hid her roots as a poor girl from Belfast. And being fashionably dressed in greens, pinks and blacks, she was always neat and tidy, but only had two sets of clothes. Rita's life would descend into disarray, and yet she always hid, ran, and never asked for help. January 1940, Rita Nelson was charged with theft. She was 13 years old. December 42, again charged with theft. May 46, she was given a six month probation for theft. September 46, age 19, she was fined 20 shillings for engaging in prostitution. November 46, one year's probation and a five pound fine for assaulting a police officer. January 47, one month in Belfast prison for breaking her probation. And April 48, she was fined 40 shillings for being drunk and disorderly. Seven arrests in eight years, all before she was 21. And although on paper she appears to be a career criminal, she may not have been an angel, but she wasn't bad, cruel or evil. She was just lost. During her teens, she was strangled so badly, her attacker fractured her hyoid bone in her throat. Her assailant was never arrested, and the bone never healed. In 1950, as an unmarried sex worker and convicted thief, 
Rita's two-year-old son, George, was taken into care. And then, in 1952, after 29 years of marriage, her parents divorced, and Rita ran away to London. Three months later, she would be dead. In March 1953, 28-year-old mother of one, Mary Ballinghall, made this statement. A man I know to be John Christie helped me onto the train at Hammersmith. We'd both been to the National Assistance Board as I was living on one pound, two shillings and six pence a week, which isn't enough. He spoke to me about his dead wife and seemed very lonely. In the Seven Stars Cafe, opposite Peter's snack bar on the Goldhawk Road, he brought me a tea, toast, cigarettes, offered me some second-hand clothes, and a pound to help me along. A couple of evenings later, I went to his home to collect the money. I sat in his deck chair, he showed me some pictures of his wife, and he cried. Suddenly he tried to kiss me, I resisted and threatened to scream. He then apologised, gave me a pound, and I left. On the 5th of October 1952, two weeks before her 25th birthday, Rita caught the overnight ferry from Belfast to Haysham in Lancashire, accompanied by her 35-year-old cousin, James Boyd, and headed to London. As a deeply private person, Rita kept herself to herself, but when asked why she had left Belfast, she said she was either looking for work or had run away from home. And yet, her work history would be patchy, and every week, without fail, she would post a letter to her mother. By lunchtime that very same day, Rita and James had called in at the home of her older sister, who lived at number 80 Ladbroke Grove, just two roads south of Tenrillington Place. And although she had reason to visit this area, her trips were infrequent, and she rarely stayed. At 5pm, Rita and James left Ladbroke Grove and headed east to Soho, looking for work. The next day, James found work on a construction site in Stratford, East London. But as a young girl with a lengthy criminal record, for Rita, times were tough. By all accounts, Rita had turned over a new leaf, and with no further arrests, and not one witness statement suggesting that she had slipped back into her old ways of drinking, stealing and prostitution, Rita would remain sober, honest and celibate. And for good reason. Struggling to hold down a series of part-time jobs, Rita's work record was chaotic. December 1952, she was an orderly at Great Ormond Street Hospital. It paid badly and gave her a place to sleep, but often feeling sick and tired, she lasted just three weeks. On the 10th of December 1952, she worked as a kitchen maid at the Devonshire Arms public house in Notting Hill Gate, where she also lived. But with her back and feet aching, she was deemed unsuitable and lasted just three days, losing her job and her lodging. In need of a bed, a fire, and being too proud to stay with her sister May, who lived just half a mile away. On the 14th of December 1952, Rita moved into a rented flat at Number 2 Shepherd's Gardens, where her 68-year-old widowed landlady, Hannah Reese, said she was polite, quiet, and kept to herself. With no friends, no close family links, and no social life, Rita's last few weeks or a mystery. With no set routine, her movements are hard to pin down, and having never visited a doctor for a health check, or signed on at the National Assistance Board to claim any unemployment benefits, it's clear that no matter how hard times got, Rita was going to do this alone. But was this through pride or shame? Three weeks before Christmas, 1952, 
Rita visited her sister in Ladbroke Grove and would later send her a festive Christmas card. And on the 18th of January 1953, two days after she had posted it, her mother Lily received the last letter that Rita would ever send. In it, she reassured her mother that she was healthy, happy and well. She told her that she was six months pregnant and that she would be returning to Belfast on the 28th of February to have the baby. Her family never saw or heard from her again. In March 1953, 42-year-old housewife Margaret Forrest of St Luke's Mews made this statement. Three weeks ago, I was in the Panda Cafe at 232 Westbourne Park Road. I was sitting at one of the tables, holding my forehead, when a man asked, Excuse me, do you suffer from migraines? I said I did, and he said he could cure it. He arranged for me to go to his house the following Saturday at 2pm, and then he left. I thought the matter over, and I didn't keep the appointment. The following Tuesday, I was in the cafe, the man came in, he was in a foul temper, and he asked me why I hadn't kept the appointment. I made my excuses. He suggested that I should see him that afternoon. I didn't answer. He said that I didn't appear interested, and said, Well, if you would rather suffer, I can't help you. I haven't seen him since. Rita's last known employment was as a counterhand at the Shepherd's Bush Tea Room at 54 Oxbridge Road in Shepherd's Bush. She started on the 6th of January 1953 for a wage of just £3.11 and shillings a week. But by Thursday the 8th, feeling sick, weak and sweating profusely, although she denied that she was unwell, Rita was moved off the shop floor and into the kitchen. She could have been sacked for dishonesty, having tried to hide her pregnancy from her employer. But with the tea room being a branch of Jay Lyons and Sons, a family business run by good people who own such well-regarded establishments as Maison Lyonnaise in Marble Arch and the Corner House Tea Room on Oxford Street, they took pity on her and wanted to help her. On Monday the 12th of January 1953, Rita was sent to Dorothy Ann Simers, medical officer for J. Lyons and Sons at 33 Orchard Street in Marleybone W1. Right there, Dorothy wrote the following letter, addressed to Evelyn Richards, the Lady Almoner of the St. Maritans Hospital for Women. It read, Dear Lady Almoner, Miss Rita Nelson has come to see me today, and I find that she is 24 weeks pregnant. She has recently come from Belfast. She has no relations or friends in London and doesn't want to return home in her condition, of which she insists she was unaware until today. I wonder if you could help her to be admitted to a home for unmarried mothers to see her through the late stages of her pregnancy. Yours sincerely, Dorothy Simers, J. Lyons and Company. That day, Rita signed for her final wages an appointment was made to visit the St. Maritans Hospital for Women the very next day, and she was handed the letter which ensured the safety and health of her and her baby. On Friday the 16th of January 1953, her landlady Hannah Rees witnessed Rita leaving her flat at number 2 Shepherd's Gardens to post a letter to her mother Lily, in which she stated that she would return home in six weeks. That was the last confirmed sighting of Rita Elizabeth Nelson. But then again, there was this. In March 1953, Margaret Ellen Sergison, owner of Peter's Snack Bar at 240 Goldhawk Road, made this statement. Reg was a regular customer. He'd come three or four times a week, often with different girls. He was very fond of saying that he was struck off as a doctor for helping a girl out. He'd say this even if they didn't ask. This one girl he met mostly in the day 
and only once in the evening. He said that she was company for his wife who was an invalid. One day, she stopped coming. He told me that if the girl ever came back, to let her have whatever she wanted, and he would settle the bill. I never saw her again. Eric Henry Webster, a lorry driver and a colleague of Reg's at British Road Services, a few doors down from Peter's snack bar, stated, She was about 18, 5 foot 3 inches tall, with brown hair. She was quite well spoken. She gave the impression of coming from a good family. She was known to us as Rita. On Saturday the 17th of January 1953, with the rent overdue, no reply to her knocks, and growing concerned, her landlady Hannah Rees reported Rita as missing at the Hammersmith police station. Having been missing for a full four days, the police gave Hannah permission to break into Rita's flat. It was exactly as she'd left it. Her bed was unmade, her clothes were on the floor, her nail polish bottle was empty, and on the bedside table lay the unopened letter addressed to the Lady Almoner of the Samaritan's Hospital for Women, eight days after it had been written. There are very few certainties with this case. When she died, we will never know. It was some time after Friday the 16th of January 1953 when she was last seen alive, but some time before the death of Kathleen Maloney, whose exact date of death is unknown. How they met, we will never know. As with Rita, being an intensely private person, with no routine or close connections, all we have are the statements Reg would give. And why she trusted him, we will never know. And yet it seems strange that for whatever reason, she shunned the help of her sister, who lived locally, hid the truth from her mother back home in Belfast, and dismissed the much-needed medical care offered by the Samaritan's Hospital. But according to those who saw them together, she knew, liked, and trusted Reg Christie. But why? Sometime in February, I went to a cafe at Notting Hill Gate for a cup of tea and a sandwich. The cafe was pretty full. There wasn't much space. Two girls were at a table. One of them asked me for a cigarette. I mentioned I was leaving my flat and that it would be vacant very soon. And they suggested coming down to see it together in the evening. Only one of them came down. She looked over the flat and said it was suitable. It was then that she made suggestions that she would stay for a few days as a sort of payment in kind. I was rather annoyed and told her that that sort of thing didn't interest me. I think she started saying I was making accusations against her when she saw that nothing was doing. She said that she would bring some boys down to do me in. I believe it was then that she mentioned something about her having Irish blood. She had a very violent temper. I remember she started fighting. I'm very quiet and avoid fighting. I know there was something else though. It's in the back of my mind. I must have put her in the alcove right away. At least, that's how Reg remembers it happening. Except the date was wrong, the location was wrong, and the other girl he mentioned was never identified and probably never existed. Evidence suggests that Rita willingly entered Ten Rillington Place, although she was never seen. She happily sat in his deck chair and chatted to Reg, although no sounds to the contrary were ever heard. And with no cuts, bruises or alcohol in her system, only a few carrots and a fragment of meat from the last meal she would ever eat just one day before, as the odourless, colourless gas drifted up from under her seat. Rita drifted in and out of consciousness. 
She wasn't dead when he strangled her. She may not have been alive when he raped her. With her body wrapped in a blanket, tied around her ankles with a plastic flex, and curled in the fetal position, Rita was hidden in a dark and dirty kitchen alcove. As with the other women, Rita was semi-clad. All that was missing was her knickers. Between her legs, he'd placed two cotton vests like a makeshift nappy. And just like Ethel, to disguise her discoloured skin, protruding tongue, and ruptured eyes, which distended out of their sockets, a knotted white towel had been tied around her head. And there she lay, rotting in a cold coal cellar, nibbled at by rats and gnawed at by maggots. As in her womb, the six-month-old fetus of a baby boy slowly suffocated. Rita Elizabeth Nelson had a tough start in life. And although a solitary figure, her stubbornness had helped her survive poverty, separation, assault and prostitution. And even being burdened by a lengthy criminal record, she had fled her own country to seek an honest job, a quiet home and a better life for her and her unborn baby, hoping to become a good mum with a chance at a bright future. But being too proud to accept help from those she loved, she found only death at the hands of a man she believed she trusted. And yet, after Rita Nelson and Kathleen Maloney, somewhere in West London, one more vulnerable woman would be lured back to Ten Rillington Place. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. If you enjoyed parts 1 to 8 of this 10 part series, part 9 of The Other Side of Ten Rillington Place continues next Thursday, with an omnibus edition after it's finished. And for any murky milers, stay tuned for the usual pointless twaddle after the break, as well as some very important news about the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast. But before that, Here's my recommended podcasts of the week, which are Whispered True Stories and Something's Not Right. Hello everyone, this is Kate Karen. You might know me as the co-host of the Forgotten News Podcast. And yes, I am whispering, but I am not whispering because I am hiding from someone or on the run. <laughs> The reason why I am whispering is because I am the host of a podcast on which you will hear whispered stories of true crime, weird disappearances, strange mysteries, wild adventures, spooky things, funny things, and also stories that listeners ask me to tell. But no matter what the topic is, the stories will always be spoken in whisper and always be 100% true. In fact, the podcast is called Whispered True Stories. <laughs> Look for it on iTunes and all of your favorite apps for podcasts. Be sure to remember the name of the show, Whispered True Stories. Thank you for listening. Hey, this is Olivia. And I'm Tashana. We're the hosts of Something's Not Right. We do a bunch of research and then we tell each other crazy stories. They're usually about true crime, but we're down to talk about anything strange or disturbing. So if that sounds like your kind of thing and you don't mind a little salty language, check us out. For more info on Something's Not Right, visit notrightpodcast.net. A huge thank you to my Patreon supporters. I know times are hard and that money is tight, so thank you to my new patrons, 
my old patrons, my non-patrons, and also patrons who are no longer with us. Because no matter how you support Murder Mile, whether by rating us, reviewing us, treating us to cake and cash, by sharing the episodes, or by just listening to the podcast, all of it is hugely appreciated. So this week's brand new Patreon supporters are Catherine Nickerson, Maria Rosa Berger, Josie Rosie, and Sarah Lahini. Thank you, ladies. You are the marzipan wrapped around my Battenberg cake, which, of course, is my favourite bit. Yummy. If only I wasn't on a diet. Damn it. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. I hope I'm not getting a cold. I might be getting a cold, or it could just be I've got no air in here. Oh, hello everyone, welcome to Extra Mile. It's me, Michael. Hello, how are you? You all good? Oh, almost knocked over the microphone then. Not a good way to start having a little swig of cup of tea, which is a bit cold. I'm not doing my usual thing of going off making a cup of tea, coming back. I'm just going to go straight into Extra Mile today because uh, I've got to head into town. I've got some things to do, so uh, I need to. A whiz through and also I'm very 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 late getting these episodes out they're becoming harder to write and tougher to write and oh like the um uh, my patreon listeners are probably going to be another day late on this one again last week's was a day late this week's maybe a day late again uh they just they just seem to be taking a lot longer to write uh anyway uh, for new people, this is Extra Mile, this is the uh, uh, waffly bit at the end, this is where I'll give you some more details about the things we've just been uh, uh, talking about. This was episode 8 of The Other Side of Ten Rillington Place, hope you're enjoying it. Uh, uh, as always, not scripted, there's no music in here, you don't have to listen to it if you don't want to. Ooh, I've got burpees. Um, but you can if you want to, people seem to enjoy it, so please do. Um... I am uh, moored up on my little boat uh, in a lovely part of town, lovely part of the town. Uh, I won't say where I am, but it's very industrial. Uh, I think I mentioned before that I had to get past a certain bridge because they were going to shut down a bridge. I've got to get, because once they shut down a bridge, you can't get through the bridge. And the, because London, unlike Venice or Birmingham or places like that, have where they have loads of canals, like Amsterdam, London only really has one canal. There's one canal going right through. And what, if at any point they shut down one part of the canal, you're stuck. You can't move anywhere. And because they're building uh, some big buildings around the corner, they were going to shut down the bridge uh to build a new towpath and you know etc etc stuff like that so they were they were like you need to get through here by january the 3rd at 8 a.m otherwise you won't get through for two months which is a pain because i need to get to the other side of town to do some boat repairs so i made it through on the second uh cut short my christmas holiday in order to make sure this was done um and it appears that they're not doing the work so, so it's still open which is really annoying. So yeah, so I'm I'm in a very industrial part of town. Uh, there's uh, this will be a pink to edit because there's uh, trucks coming in and out behind me, trucks coming out in front of me. I'm doing this early in the morning because my neighbour next door is a bit of a prick, uh, and he has his generator on every night. It's meant to be off at eight o'clock. He had it on until two a.m. last night, so I didn't get much sleep. So I'm I'm looking forward to moving my boat and probably I might leave my little sarcastic note as well uh anyway that's that done that's where i am uh going to whiz through this for you also i had a, a question from oh yeah no tomorrow i've got my first murder mile of the of the year <gasps> I've, had, I've had three weeks without doing a murder mile walk oh god i hope i can remember all my words good luck to anyone who's on the first one that's that'll be the 6th the 6th of january i don't even know what day it is i'm all over the shop at the moment yeah it'll be the 6th of january tomorrow Oh dear, and I'll be in editing this at 5 a.m. and before the tour. Oh dear lord. Right, so uh, I had a question from a listener, Simon Lewis. Thank, thank you, Simon. Uh, Simon mentioned 
Uh, has the internet caused the monkey bookshops in Soho to reduce the number of new, lurid literature? As the oh, uh, see, I can't read and talk. Um, has the internet caused the monkey bookshops in Soho to reduce in number as lurid literature lovers go online? Good alliteration there. I like that. Um, there has been the, the, it, it, it. It's it hasn't really been the internet that's caused less monkey bookshops in Soho. It's the the council uh, changed. Uh, how they see it like in the 70s and 80s it was full of mucky bookshops but they're trying to turn Soho back into a kind of a hip funky place so what they're doing is they're getting rid getting rid of almost all of the sex shops and mucky bookshops and stuff like that and the ones that they're leaving there are the kind of the it's the same as everywhere where there's where the bloody hipsters live is that you know they they get rid of uh like a lower class bakers to put in an artisan bakers or they get rid of like a a coffee shop to put in an artisan coffee shop so what they're doing at the moment is they're 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 turning the 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 sexy shops the the mucky book shops which you know is the reason why people come to soho i think there should be some still there because it's not soho unless you got the mucky book shops i think they're, they're they're starting to turn a lot of them into erotic literature places or do you know um uh, books full of books which basically in the 1960s 1970s would have been regarded as pornography but aren't now now they're regarded as art so do you know it's uh, i think they need to retain some of the the muckiness in soho otherwise it's not soho anymore it's kind of it's losing it's 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 becoming the same as most other places where do you know uh it's it's becoming generically funky which I don't think it should be. I think I think I think you need to have some originality in there, and that's what Soho has, and that's what's dying is the the heart of Soho. Anyway, you know, that's what it is. Um, so, uh, God, I'm really tired today. So uh, I'm going to whiz through a couple of interesting things uh, to do with this case that you might have mentioned. So at the very start, I put in uh, a mention about uh, PC Mount, who we mentioned PC three three eight. Uh, this is this is a piece that I've been trying to get into the story for bloody ages. I think I mentioned it in episode three. You, if you go back, you'll hear that I mentioned uh, 133 St. Mark's Road, and I actually put this in there, and then I partially then I took it out in the edit. Then I think I m mentioned about a skull being found. If you go back, you'll find that is either in episode four or five. So that's important. That's in there. That's about skull being found. You'll you'll see the mention about the uh, milky white uh, bone uh, and like an old stick stripped of bark. I've been putting that hint in. And then I needed to get to this bit now because this bit's really important. Um, and I didn't. Know, I haven't been able to find where to get it. Get it. Put it in. So I've put it into this episode, and I hope I don't edit it out because I need it. Well, I kind of need it for episode ten at least. Oh, it's hard to when you're writing a ten part series. It's hard to know where to put everything to make it to make it coherent and also you don't want to slow down the episode so this is one of those things that i've been trying to get in for ages uh and it, this is not a full resolution anyway i haven't hopefully if you've been following the story you'll know exactly whose skull that is uh if you want to you can say the name now say the name now i'm not going to say the name but hopefully you'll find out later on because there's, the, there's there's details even if you go back to episode one there are details which you will discover in episode 10 there are details in episode three, like all of the cases that you've heard of before. If 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 you know the way that I write, the way that I, I structure these, I don't give you all the details. I think there's nothing worse than just giving going. Bleh, here's all the details. Bleh. What I try to do is it's called for those who don't know, it's called suspense. Yeah. So there are details with each every single case that you've heard of. Uh, which is why I always say every week, don't come to me and say, Oh, you've missed a bit. It's like don't say, Michael, you've missed a bit when you're on episode seven. I've still got episodes to write and I've got loads to pack into episode 10. This is where episode 10 is the one where you'll go back and go, oh, yes, I remember all that. It's the oh. So um, this was the discovery of that skull. Uh, that was at 133 St. Mark's Road. It's slightly down from uh, Thomasina Probert's house, uh, not far away from uh, Ten Rillington Place, and also not too far away from where Beryl, um, Beryl Evans, as she would uh, originally lived with her family. Uh, so 
Yeah, it was on, where was it? Uh, 6th of December 1949, which is ironic. This was just days before Timothy John Evans was arrested at 2.10pm. Uh, uh, reports at Harrow Road Police Station of some children playing in a derelict building. The building had been bombed uh, on the 16th of November 1940, so almost a decade it had been there. It had been uh, part of the first original aerial bombardment. It had been bombed. It had been blown out. Kids were playing in there. There was some corrugated iron over some of the doors. Um, uh, and in there, the police were called in and they, they found that the kids were playing with uh, a skull, a human skull, a female human skull. She was female and uh, determined in her early 30s and her jaw was missing. There were no other body parts found. Found... Um, uh, so I will conclude that in episode 10. But obviously, um, if you've been paying attention, ooh, uh, you'll know who that is. Or will you? Or will you? Uh, I just wanted to go through a couple of other things as well. So I, I, to make this episode different and to show you that these weren't the only victims of Reg Christie. Um, we always say that there's kind of Reg attacked eight women. Uh, there's there's loads there's loads of kind of murdered prostitutes in the 1940s 1950s as you know listening to this series and there are many that they believe reg also murdered as well but what i wanted to do was show you that it's not just it's not just one-offs he's he's a serial predator he's constantly on the look all the time he's always looking so that's why i've put loads into here to show you how he lures women in but also that he's he's not super successful he's not do you know he is a failure these he picks super vulnerable women and he plays on their vulnerability and he works very hard. He works, he spends months trying to shape them and, and to lure them into his world as he did with, uh, Muriel Edie and, uh, um, you know, that, but that was months. She, there was no reason for her to kind of like him, but he spent months working with her and, you know, they worked together at ultra electrics and he was really trying to work hard to, to lure her into his confidence so he could drug her, rape her, kill her. That's what he does. So I thought I'd throw in some other ones here. So uh, we mentioned I mentioned earlier on about Mary Billinghall. Uh, she was a slim brunette. It's written here, mildly pretty. Uh, this was actually the, this report never made it into the police file. This was inside the uh, the police file, but it was it was a, a tabloid news story. So whether they actually, whether she actually originally went to the police, I don't know, but it wasn't in the original file. Uh, she was 28 years old. Um, I edited this down for clarity, but she went to Christie's house several times. She had a three month old baby. Uh, this is the bit I mentioned. He they met when he helped her onto a train at the Hammersmith uh, tube station, and they were heading to Ladbrook Grove. They'd both been to the National Assistance Board, which is basically the unemployment office. You go there uh, to get your dole money. Uh, she was living on a small amount of money, which wasn't enough to live on. He treated her to cups of tea at the Seven Stars Cafe on the Goldhawk Road, which is that important roundabout that we were just talking about. Basically, there were two cafes on that big roundabout. Uh, one was Peter's. This was the Seven Stars. He talked to her. He gave her a pound to help her along, bought her cigarettes. Uh, and she said he was very lonely and mentioned a lot that his wife had been dead for many years. Obviously, uh, his wife hadn't been dead for many years. She'd been dead for about a month. Uh, he invited her round. She came. She sat in the deck chair. Uh, she mentioned that be behind her was the gas stove. A few feet in front was the alcove in which, by that point, Rita, Le Rita Nelson's body may already have been in there. Um, she also mentioned that he had a mongrel dog, which he did. He also had a cat as well. I've just uh, I've entirely removed his cat from the story because it doesn't the cat doesn't do anything as cats do they just sh they just shit and piss everywhere uh where's the, the mongrel dog there's oh i'm gonna get complaints from people who love cats aren't, aren't i um uh, but the mongrel dog uh judy actually plays an important role in the story that's why i focused on the dog and not the cat uh christy put uh, more coal on the fire she said the room was unbearably hot whether he was trying to get her to take her clothes off or to wear less, I don't know. Uh, she asked him to open a, a window. He refused. So obviously he's trying not to drug her at that point. Because um, if he would have put the gas on, it would have sparked and they would all be dead. Uh, she said nothing happened. He gave her another pound to help her out and invited her round again. Did he lose his nerve at this point? We don't know. Uh, a few evenings later, you can see why I've shortened this down. A few e evenings later, he took her into the bedroom to show her pictures of his wife. 
Why would he do that? We don't know. Why would he take her into the bedroom? We don't know. Uh, at this time, his wife was obviously underneath the floor floorboards. Uh, he had tears in his eyes when he discussed, discussed his wife. This is kind of an abbreviation of her statement because it was very long, so I had to cut it down. Uh, he then took her back into the kitchen, sat her in the deck chair and gave her some port. Now, we know he did this a lot. He, have, he gave a lot of his victims whiskey or port. But with uh, Ruth Nelson, because she didn't drink, she had no alcohol in his system. Uh, in her system, sorry. Uh, where did I get to? Where did I get to? Uh, he talked about his work in the police force, which he did a lot. We know that. Uh, he gave her another pound and then asked her to come back again. He's giving out a lot of pounds. A pound in that era is just over thirty pounds. So when you're unemployed, that's quite a lot of money. Uh, she did. She came back again. He tried to kiss her in the bedroom. She resisted, and he threatened to scream. He apologized and gave her another pound. Okay, so it's getting close to ninety pounds. Uh, every night in the kitchen, she saw a pair of blue suede boots. I haven't found who, who those blue suede boots are for. But hopefully one day we will, or maybe they're just not connected at all. He had a lot of women's clothes in there, so don't forget he was. Don't forget he was. Uh, I'll mention this now. Uh, as she sat on the deck chair, uh, he would sit on a little stool, which we know he did a lot. The kitchen was tiny; there was no space for two chairs. He asked her to stay the night. She said no. He gave her presents of ladies' handbags, which were almost certainly off many of his victims and in total he gave her 10 pounds which would be about 300 pounds today uh he spoke well and was polite and generous but seemed very lonely mm -hmm. so that was that one. Oh dear Whew, i'm out of breath uh okay this was the uh there were two statements here i've kind of merged them into one this was the second one at the panda cafe so first statement was from ada ellen robinson a uh, 41-year-old waitress at the Panda Cafe at uh, 232 Westbourne Park Road, which is just down the road from Labrook Grove. Uh, she said, sometime after Christmas 1952, she described Reg Christie, in this, and it was accurate. She knew Reg Christie anyway. He used to come in for a morning cup of tea, lunch and tea about 4.30pm. He never seemed to be short on cash. Um, even though he was unemployed at that point, he was obviously selling off uh the the stuff of his personal possessions of his victims but also his wife's stuff as well we'll get into that in episode 10 uh he last came to the cafe about four weeks ago so that would have been mid to late february according to this uh prior to this uh he had ceased to call in every day uh and used to come in about th just about three times a week he never said anything out of place to me he always seemed very nervous a Mrs. Forrest of Luke's Muse, who we've mentioned uh, uh, in the episode as well, I'll come to that shortly, regularly used the cafe and he appeared to be very interested in her. He often spoke to her and one day Mrs. Forrest told me that uh, he had asked her to go around to his house. She had told him that she suffered from headaches and he suggested he go around to his home and he'd give her a cure. Uh, she never went. She once told me that he had been a doctor and that he had been struck off the register for helping a girl out of trouble. Out of trouble. His thing that he says a lot to everyone. Whether women are uh, have colds or bad knees or Qatar or anything like that, he always knows that you know there's a chance one day a woman's going to be pregnant. And because abortions are illegal, he knows he can use that to his advantage at that point. Um, he said this about six weeks ago. Around the time I'd been off with the flu and he offered me offered to get me some medicine. See, he's trying it with the uh, waitress as well. He also offered to help Mrs. Robinson, uh, a waitress there, with a bottle of pills as she was suffering from overstrain. He is non-stop. He is literally non-stop. Uh, in all of the cafes he goes into, when he talks to anyone, he would always show them a photo of his wife uh, stating... Either, this is interesting, stating, this is what Ada says, stating that she was in Birmingham, although often he would say that she was dead, and that he was going to join her, obviously in Birmingham, not death, although later on he would. Uh, it's almost like a routine for him. Uh, and then we had the one, uh, which is later on, which was the possible sighting of Rita Nelson. So this was whilst Reg Christie was working at British Road Services as a truck driver uh, at uh, this company. It was the Shepherd's Bush Depot, which was literally just down the road. Like uh, barely, uh, when you look at the map, it's about 10, 20 doors down from, uh, from the roundabout where Peter Snagbar was. 
And Margaret Ellen Sergison, the proprietor of the snack bar, uh, <coughs> um, she she knew Reg really well, and she got to see Rita because Rita would come there a lot. Now I've kind of merged a lot of these uh, references together, these statements together, because they don't they don't work properly. But so I've had to I've had to piece them together slightly. Uh, so he would come and visit three or four times a week. He doesn't seem to eat at home at all, does he? He's always in cafes all the time. Three or four times a week, breakfast, breakfast lunch, dinner. Uh, Christy was seen there with the girl on many occasions. Uh, she, now, they always say that the girl was about 18 years old. But then again, Ruth did look a lot younger than she was. Uh, she said she was about five or two. She's actually five five, but that's fine. Uh, well built, round faced. Uh, Dark straight hair. Her hands and fingernails were not well kept. Although she would paint, I, I tried to get this into the story, but I, I couldn't make it work. Although she loved putting on a lipstick and and fingernails, uh, the poorer she got, the more people started noticing that you know her, her nail polish was very chipped and her, her nails were chipped as well. Uh, she was employed, apparently, at Messrs Wimpy on the Gold Hole Road. This is like the if. Uh, British people will know that will be the Wimpy Burger Bar, which only just still slightly exists. Uh, I don't have evidence whether Ruth actually worked at Wimpy's, but given the fact that she only lasted like between three days and three weeks at most jobs, who knows when she was working there. Uh, Christy often used to meet the, meet the girl by arrangement, mostly in the day, but once in the evening. Uh, and as I mentioned before, one day she suddenly stopped coming and he said that if ever she turned up, he would settle the bill for her. Uh, right. There was another story. This was around mid-February. Um, I didn't put this in because it's hard to pin down who it was. But mid-February, that same lady, so uh, what was her, Margaret Ellen Sergison, who ran Peter's Cafe, uh, Peter's Snack Bar, sorry. Uh, around mid-February, she saw Christy outside of the Shepherd's Bush Empire, which is a big theatre in Shepherd's Bush Green, probably about 10 minutes from the cafe. Uh uh he said that the girl who was uh the that girl which is meant to be ruth she says that girl but it's not clear whether it was ruth or not because she doesn't say it uh wasn't there anymore had left him he said that she had gone to join the land army um but that she was still writing to him uh during this time uh uh, oh, uh, so during this time, uh, when he met her, Christie had a lot of scratches on his face and his glasses were repaired with ad adhesive tape. Now, this is interesting. Around this point, there's a lot of references to Christie having scratches on his face. So uh, what is going on here? We're not too sure. Maybe he's uh, met with uh, some sex workers or some people he shouldn't have met with. Uh, but yeah, Um and also, I, I merged in this story uh, from e uh, Eric Henry Webster, who was a lorry driver at British Road Services at the Shepherd's Bush Depot on Gold Hook Road. Um, Christie actually worked at two branches of uh, British Road Services. There was this one at Gold Hook Road, which he was at up until about October. And then he was moved to the Hampstead branch uh, for the latter part of the year before he quit the job. Uh, but still during that time, when he wasn't working, he would still come down to... Um, Peter's snack bar. Uh, now Eric said uh, there was a girl who was who also used to go there. She was known to us as Rita. She was about eighteen years old, five foot three in height, brown hair with a fringe on to her forehead. She was quite well spoken and gave the impression of coming from a good family. She was usually dressed in green corduroy trousers, a jumper, a blouse, short skirt, and flat heeled shoes. Christy used to speak to her, and they seemed very friendly. This is interesting. This I didn't put this in the story, but this is interesting. One day she came to the depot. So that was British Road Services on Gold Hawk Road. She came into the depot uh, and I heard someone shout to Christy that there was a girl for him. Christy came out of the office and I saw him speaking to Rita. They were together for 15 minutes and then he left. Uh, this was a few weeks before Christy left, before he left the job. Uh, I never saw him again, and she never came back to the cafe. Mm. Interesting. So, it's, uh, but it, you know, with with Ruth's story, there's a lot of things that are really hard to pin down. A lot of things that are hard to get absolutely right. So, uh, yeah, there's some uh, some details in there that I have. Um, 
I won't make a cup of tea. Uh, some details in there that, are, that, you know, I've deliberately been vague with it because it's hard to pin down how accurate they are, whether they're true, whether they're not true. Which, you know, it's as I always say, it's, you know, it's people's interpretation. So what this is, as before, what this is, is a story, not just about the victim story, but also kind of Reg's interpretation of what is going on, of what is happening around this era. So uh, we've got episode nine next week and then... Oh, you'll be the last victim of Reg Christie, and then it'll be episode ten, which I'll go through. I'll do. Um, I'll go th- right through Reg's Reg's life up until his final days. So it will be birth to death. So hopefully, episode ten will answer all of your questions. Uh, what I might do is when we get to past episode 10 what, what i might do let's do this an idea what i might do is maybe i'll do a, a q and a episode yeah that's a good idea i'll make a note for myself i'll do a q and a episode i need a pen and if you got a pen and we got a pen i'll do a q and oh my pen is gone missing from there someone remind me oh no i found a pen i'll do a q and a episode so what i'll do is i'll do episode 10 uh and then uh i'll give you a couple of days to send me your questions if you've got any questions i'll try and answer them Oh, right. That was good. I hope you enjoyed that. Right. Important news about Murder Mile. Ah, uh, okay. Well, um, it's something has been on my mind for a long time. Uh, as you know, I work hard to make Murder Mile as good as I can make it. It's a very complicated thing to do. Uh, it takes about 60 to 80 hours a week because I have to research the cases and then I have to find the facts that no one else goes looking for and then I have to assemble it all together then I have to work out what the story is then I have to write it as a story and then I have to record it then I have to edit it and you know uh, it used to to take like six days to do an episode now it's taken between seven and ten days to do an episode which is not good when you're doing a weekly podcast uh so i'm finding that i'm doing a lot of episodes all at the same time doing multiple episodes uh, which can be quite tiring and uh as much as i've enjoyed doing murder mile i it's i i find that i'm just i just don't really have a life anymore all i do is my podcast that's what which i i, I love podcasting but it literally has taken over my life it's like 14 16 hours a day sometimes 18 hours a day seven days a week I'm just not getting any fun or rest. And do you know what? It's my fault because it's how I designed Murder Mile. It was to make it very intricate. Uh, what I could do is make Murder Mile shorter. But then if I make it shorter, it's not as engaging. It's about you know, really a, a whole episode. I want it to be a whole episode like a TV series. If I make it every two weeks, you know, people will forget about Murder Mile. So it's not really about simplifying it. Uh, I still love all the storytelling and the problem solving. Um, but... It's not really sustainable anymore. Um, And what I don't want to do is to really lose the quality of the episodes. I try to make them as high quality as possible. So, you know, you dedicate your time, uh, your valuable time into listening to the podcast. And what I don't want to do is give you something half-hearted and shitty, which is is why quite often I'll write an episode, then I'll rewrite it. Because I'd rather give you something really good that you really love than giving you something half-assed and half-baked and, you know, something that I've just read off Wikipedia. Um, I think I've also been struggling with Murder Mile a bit because it's a bit hit and miss. Do you know, although people seem to like it, it, it sort of works for me. It doesn't quite work. It's it's kind of very much like Marmite. You know, you either love it or you hate it. And you can see that with the reviews, you know. But, do you know, it gets lots of five-star reviews, which is lovely. I really do, really just buoy me up when people leave lovely reviews and their lovely kind words, which has been fantastic. Uh, but have a look. It also gets loads of one-star reviews because people really do hate it. Um, and then it got, gets loads of two, threes and fours from people who just aren't sure. And do you know what? I totally get that. It's... it. As a podcast, and I'm pushing hard to get the numbers up. It's really plateaued. It's kind of it's bottoming out now. It's kind of reached its peak, and uh, I think it turns off as many people as it turns on. And what I really want to do is create a podcast that that people do is really beloved. I want people to absolutely love it. Do you know, if you're going to dedicate as much time as I do to a podcast, you really want people to love it. And as much as I would, God, I would love to be able to just make 
this podcast just for the people who absolutely really really love it and really adore it and you know it's their favorite podcast and i i, I absolutely oh, i really love that i do it's it's not just that i can't financially sustain it it's i think just physically and emotionally i just i can't sustain it i'm basically just tired and broke and i think also there's a moral issue as well this has slowly crept in over time that uh do you know, i love telling victim stories uh do you know people waffle on about the killers all the time i'm not really that bothered it's victim stories they're the ones that get forgotten um and do you know it's been really good do you know i've had loads of families of the victims get in touch and say do you know thank you for telling their story and do you know that that's it's really nice to hear because they are forgotten you listen to any story out there it's all blah 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 jeffrey dharma blah 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 what it could, but think about jeffrey dharma okay name name all of his victims you can't you can't i mean do you know what even even with reg christie i at the start of this i would have struggled to remember uh, to name anyone but beryl beryl and timothy evans and geraldine evans is the victims so um so it's so it's really nice to kind of give give that kind of voice to the victims but the more the, the kind of the more i go through it the more i talk to the families the more i realize that i'm kind of making entertainment out of something that's deeply personal um to these people and you know it's something very painful and something that quite often they'd rather forget and one thing that i'm realizing now is that because we don't always know the people in our families we don't know them well we always go oh well you know he's my brother and i know he's i've known him for all, all these years but you don't really know someone truly which is why when someone dies and you have to go through all their things you go oh you find things you find letters you find you find hobbies that they had and you go i didn't know that because we don't we don't tell people everything and what i'm finding is that by going through all the police files i'm finding out details about family members that they didn't know and do you know what they probably will they probably never wanted to know and uh they'll probably never forget as well when they listen to the podcast um and they hear the details that i put down and it's i'm hoping that one day i can resolve this uh, it's a moral issue for me at the moment that i'm struggling with but what i find is that i find it really difficult to write these episodes knowing that i'm causing someone pain do you know, it's it's that's that's not why I started for. That's not why I started doing this. But it's and even though it, and even though I fight to tell the victim stories and to, and to get it accurate and real and you know it's still I still know that there will be people listening to it upset about it and uh, that's hard to resolve. Uh, so uh, we still got two more episodes to go in the season don't wait i don't I, I don't plan to stop even though these episodes are really hard to write at the moment uh, i have no plans to disappoint you by ending the season early i would never do that you know i would never do that uh so we've got two more episodes to go uh we will do the omnibus edition which i'll edit together i've just agreed to do a q a episode which will do that uh and then after part 10 of the other side of 10 Rillington place sorry uh the omnibus edition then well i'll do in the Q&A will be a farewell episode. Uh, as not everyone listens to Extra Mile, so, do you know, uh, there will be some people who've switched off already and won't know this already. Um, but then, uh, Murder Mile, I'm sorry to say, but it will end. Uh, Murder Mile may return in a different form, um, but the podcast will come to an end. Uh Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone for their support, really. Ugh. So I uh, just wanted to thank everyone for their support. Um, everyone, oh, come on. So, come on, Michael. So, uh, Everyone's been really lovely, and uh, <laughs> Murder Mile started with just nine downloads. Nine downloads, that was where we started. And I'll be honest, five of them were me, uh, trying to see if it worked. Um, but we ended up, there's, there's Coot, 
joining in behind us uh it, but we've ended uh, over a million downloads which has been fantastic um it's so it's lovely to hear from people all over the world and um people who've been really great and you know meeting many of you as well on, on my walks as well that's been uh, re really nice but you know it's I, I think you can tell with this with sadness Ugh. Uh, so sadly Murder Mart will be coming to an end <sighs> but but oh god thank god for this bit but don't subscribe don't unsubscribe now please don't unsubscribe even though obviously we've got two episodes still to come and some extra bits don't uns unsubscribe now because this is not the end this is not the end. This is ju just the beginning. So, what? Why did I come to this decision? Obviously, the the the, the things I mentioned already, but the the obviously there's things I love about Murder Mile. The, 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 as you can tell, there are the things I absolutely love about Murder Mile. I love about you guys. I love about this whole world that I've got. But there are also things that I hate as well. Um. And I listen to everyone's comments, and everyone's comments have been great. And um, that's really helped me shape what I want to do next. So this isn't the end. This is this is the next step. So uh, what I really want to do is create a new podcast. Um, something uh, th th that's based on the, the mistakes that I think I've made with Murder Mile. But, you know, moving ahead for the future. So uh, I'm doing a new podcast. You'd be delighted to hear. It's not going to be true crime. I really want to get away from true crime. I want to get away from murder. I want to get away from depressing stuff. I want to get away from research as well. And I want to start going back to using my creativity, my my imagination again. Uh, murder Mile, I, I love, but I love, I love the storytelling, and that's what I want to do: is really create something for you, which is maybe the antithesis of true crime. So when you listen to all your true crime, and uh, I, I'm hoping this will allow me to start re-listening to true crime again, because I do still love true crime. I'm hoping that uh, I can create something that after you've listened to true crime and you've listened to all people getting their heads cut off, you go right. I want to listen to something funny, something uplifting, something entertaining. So what it's going to be is the culmination of everything that you love or that you've told me that you love about Murder Mile. So it's going to be storytelling. <coughs> it's going to be me coughing. It's going to be storytelling. It's going to be characters. It's going to be music and the sounds. It's going to be the right platform for me to do my crappy accents. <gasps> crappy accents. It will be the place where you will come for crappy accents. There'll be lashings of humour. And there will be a special kind of extra mile type bit at the end, only much better. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about it at the moment, uh, but uh, it's all very exciting. So I've already purchased some new recording equipment, uh, some new specialist recording equipment, because there are things that I want to do with this new episode. Um, I've done the logo. Uh, I've, I've done the title. I'm not going to tell you what it is because there are things I need to do first. So by the time you will have listened to this, when this goes out next Thursday, that day, I will already have... Uh, oh, uh, actually, you, uh, you'll probably hear this before I have that meeting. That's interesting. Uh, I, <laughs> unless you're my Patreon listeners, you would have listened to this yesterday. Oh, fuck. Uh, so I will have already met with my podcast host and told them my plans. Uh, I've already mapped out the first 100 episodes, which is great. Uh, and I know, uh, having learned from my mistakes and uh, learned a lot by doing these episodes, I, I think this is very much something that I can uh, easily create in about 20 to 30 hours a week. I'm not going to be doing any research with it. It's all going to be just my imagination, my uh, creativity. Uh, and uh, I'll be able to do it without losing the will to live, <laughs> which would be good. And it also it will give me time to relax time to have fun time to engage more with you guys online because I, I that's one of the things i love but that's it's it, at the moment it's really hard because i don't have to, i don't have time to do all the social media it's kind of a burden at the moment but what i want to do is kind of enjoy it more and have more time to kind of talk to you and say hi and rather than just saying thank you for your email blah 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 uh, also it'll give me a time to make some interesting merch to go with it uh do some live shows which would be nice it'd be like nice to go back to doing live shows again uh and also this is more exciting uh to make other podcasts i've got loads of other 
podcast ideas that I want to start playing with. Uh, but obviously doing Murder Mile, which is 70, 80 hours a week, it'll probably be near 100 if I were to keep going because I'm flagging out. What I want to do is if I can create podcasts that only take me like, there's a couple of ideas that I know will only take me like, five or ten hours a week but they'll be really good so i want to be able to do those so that's where we're going don't um don't click unsubscribe at the moment because you won't know what it the show is called so as you already know uh i was planning to take six weeks off anyway at the end of the season uh and to start researching season three which i'd already started uh albeit reluctantly uh, and I was going to repair, you know, do repairs to my boat, and then we were going to come back in about six weeks' time. So, in a few weeks' time, in this, in the Murder Mile promo feed, so what you're listening to now, uh, what I will do is I will introduce you to what is going to become your new obsession. Oh, this is very exciting! Your new favorite podcast. And in that feed, what I'll do, uh, I need to think about this, but what I'll definitely do is I'll put a link to it for you. So you don't really won't need to do anything. You'll just go into the show notes and go glink or the, the name of the show will be there. And hopefully by then I might have a promo done. Uh, and then I might start sharing it around with if there are any other podcasts out there who fancy helping out, out uh, a podcast right from the start. Eek, going back to the early days, that'd be really helpful. So, uh, yeah, this is very exciting. Very exciting times. Uh, not sad times. And, you know, Murder Mile isn't dead. It's just resting. Uh, so, I'm sorry if that came as a bit of a shock. You know what? It's been, it's been on my mind for a long time. And it's kind of... Uh, the fact that people really love the show has kept me going, but kind of yeah, kind of it's been i'm slowing down and slowing down and then over christmas i had a chance to have like a bad a, a day to two days rest and i realized i'd missed resting i'd missed meeting friends i'd missed meeting family do you know just simple things in life and and knowing that I, do you know even though it's meant to be six weeks off i wasn't going to have six weeks off it was going to be six weeks of research and it's like it's unsustainable and also, do you know, Murder Mile, it's time to move on. So it's been a hard decision because, yeah, you know, Murder Mile, the podcast has been a big part of my life. The tours, I'm probably going to shut down in about a year's time. Uh, people have bought vouchers, so the vouchers are still valid for a year. Uh, I'm going to, uh, but yeah, in about a year's time, uh, the Murder Mile will be gone. The blog is starting to be deleted. I'm starting to do that. Uh, Murder Mile will be no more, which is it, which is really annoying because I've, <laughs> I've already bought loads of mugs, mugs and badges, a, a shit ton of badges. You have no idea how many badges I've bought. It's so annoying, but do you know what? It was uh, having time off over Christmas it really helped me make a decision, and it's been a tough decision, as you can probably tell. But <sighs> I need to think about the future. And do you know what? If you don't learn from your mistakes, what's the point? What's the point? What's I don't want. I don't want to be here in five years, still doing the same old, same old crap. What I want to do is in five years' time to have like three or four great podcasts, and maybe, maybe, Murder Mile will come back in a different form. Who knows? Maybe as a podcast, maybe as a TV series. Who knows? Who knows? So, I hope that wasn't too shocking for everyone. I hope no one's too upset about it. Um, as I said, this isn't the end. This is just the beginning this is just the beginning murder mile was the first step in a big long journey and do you know what we'll look back fondly on it many years to come we'll go oh I remember the days and we'll we'll have a little giggle and we'll listen to all the the bits in murder mile that didn't quite work and then we'll look at the stuff that I'm doing five years down the line and we'll go oh wow how times have changed anyway I thought I'd end this by just saying a big thank you to everyone who's listened, everyone who's supported the podcast, everyone who's just, just everyone who's been great. Everyone has been really lovely. Uh, that is the end of part eight of The Other Side of Ten Rillington Place. Uh, part nine next week. Need to write that. Part ten coming up. It's all, re don't worry, it's all researched. I've just got to piece it all together. I've just got to write the story and piece it all together. And then we'll uh, we'll have the farewell episode and then we'll move on to the new podcast Ooh, yes there will be mugs before you say it yes there will be mugs don't worry there will be mugs so uh i'll catch you soon you'll be good now bye <laughs>